moments sublime with intervals <laughs> hilarious while drinking. I love the way Bill writes. I was part of life at last, and in the midst of the excitement I discovered liquor. I forgot the strong warnings and prejudices of my people concerning drink. In time we sailed for over there. I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. We landed in England. I visited Winchester Cathedral. Much moved, I wandered outside. My attention was caught by a dog on an old tombstone. Here lies the Hampshire grenadier who caught his death drinking cold small beer. A good soldier has never forgot whether he dies by a musket or by pot. Now, for you younger guys, that talking about musket or by pot, we're not talking about that wacky weed that you <laughs> use today. We're talking about a pot of beer. That's the way it used to be served in England back in this particular part of part of the times. I have a bunch of pictures up here which you're welcome to come by and look at. I'll put them over here on the floor. But here's that tombstone in Winchester Cathedral. And the name on it is Thomas Thatcher. Thatcher. Evie Thatcher, Thomas Thatcher. I don't know if that had any connection, but it just happened to be the name on there. Very, very interesting. There's more to that little doggerel than what we just read. Here's a picture of the gatehouse where Bill and Bob first met. It's open today to the public. They just opened it recently and restored that room that they met in for those hours, those five hours. And if the public can go in and out of that room now and see it. It's decorated just the way it was, almost the way it was. It's now on the his National Historic Register. It will never be changed in the future. Yeah, yeah this is a cyberling estate. This is a <clears throat> gatehouse. The mansion is behind it. <laughs> yeah, It's got four bowling alleys in the basement. Kind of interesting. Beautiful place. Here's a little uh, saying that's in, in New Bedford, Connecticut, where Bill and his wife last lived. This is over Bill's headboard where he slept. Uh, a few years ago, Charlie and I were up in Albany, New York, and we learned that uh, Abby Thatcher was buried in Albany. We thought he was in Texas, but uh, we decided we'd go out and find his grave. And some of us went out there, and we finally found the Thatcher place, and weeds were up over our head. And this is an Abby picture of his grave. We took a, cleaned the weeds off and took a picture. Forgotten man in Alcoholics Anonymous. Had it not been for Ebby bringing the message to Bill, we may not be here. Ebby is a very important to our whole Alcoholics Anonymous. And here's a picture of uh, Lois and, and Bill's tombstone up in Vermont. When you're there, there's a spiritual experience about being there. It's a little bitty nondescript graveyard alongside the road. Quiet, quiet, quiet there. And there's a bucket right here. If you ever go, take your little sobriety chip with you. Put it in that bucket and find one like it and take it with you. That's called pass it on, by the way. And here's a picture of William Silkworth's uh, gravestone, Dr. Bob's gravestone. Here's a picture of the church directory in the hotel, Mayflower Hotel is still there. The phone that was used had been stolen three times up there by somebody. But this little thing is still there. Maybe. Hope not. There's Bill and Bob in their earlier days. Dr. Bob. Sister Ignatia. She, she and Dr. Bob worked with thousands and thousands of alcoholics. She's the one that started the little sobriety chip. She would give them this little chip when they left the hospital. Tell them to call them chip. They felt like getting drunk. There's a, the Lassiter Award. There's a picture of, uh, who is that, Charlie? Sam Shoemaker. Sam Shoemaker. I couldn't think of his name. He was Bill's spiritual advisor, one of them. Here's a picture of the uh, Clinton Street where Bill and... Lois lived for numbers of years. Bill and Lois lived with with people in Alcoholics Anonymous for years. They didn't have a home. 23 years they didn't have a home. That's part of it. There's Ebby and Bill, and that picture's over there on the wall. Picture of Bill, the uh, Akron City Hospital, Silkworth, and again the little 
gatehouse. But these pictures are available to you if you if you want to come by and look at them. Kind of a nice little collection of things. But anyhow, he says, ominous warning which I failed to heed. Twenty-two and a veteran of foreign wars, I went home at last. I fancied myself a leader, for had not the men of my battery given me a special token of appreciation? My talent for leadership, I imagine, would place me at the head of vast enterprises, which I would manage with utmost assurance. He said, I took a night law course and obtained employment as an investigator for a surety company. The drive for success was on. I'd prove to the world that I was important. I already identified with Bill Wilson. All I ever wanted to do was succeed at something, prove to the world that I'm important also. I find that one of the main characteristics behind every alcoholic I've ever known. By God, we're going to show them that we're just as good as they are. That great, great driving characteristic to prove to the world and everybody in it that we're just as good as they are. He said, my work took me about Wall Street, and little by little I became interested in the market. Many people lost money, but some became very rich. Well, why not I? I studied economics and business as well as law. Potential alcoholic that I was, I nearly failed my law course. At one of those finals, I was too drunk to think or to write. Though my drinking was not yet continuous, it disturbed my wives. I can identify with Bill. <laughs> my wives were very disturbed. Married and divorced to two women seven times. They were very disturbed. What would you say? Two of them seven times. That, that may not be a record, but it's getting damn close, isn't it? Huh? It'll, it'll give you brain damage, I can tell you that. We had long talks when I would steal her forebodings by telling her that men of genius conceive their best projects when drunk that the most majestic constructions of philosophic thought were so derived. Bill made his living selling fast talk to slow-thinking people. He was trying to sell some of that right here, but you know the lawyers didn't buy that. He said, by the time I had completed the course, I knew the law was not for me. The inviting maelstrom of Wall Street, maelstrom of Wall Street had me in its grip. Business and financial leaders were my heroes. Out of this alloy of drink and speculation, I commenced to forge the weapon that one day thrown in its flight like a boomerang and all but cut me to ribbons. Living modestly, my wife and I saved $1,000. It went into certain securities then cheap and rather unpopular. I rightly imagined that they would someday have a great rise. I failed to persuade my, persuade my broker friends to send me out looking over factories and managements. But my wife and I decided to go anyway. I had developed a theory that most people lost money in stocks through ignorance of markets. I discovered many more reasons later on. Now Bill is referring to a time back in the 1920s. The stock market was on a roll, and just about everybody that dealt with stocks were making money out of it. All you had to do is buy them, hold them a while, let them go up in price, sell them, take your profits, buy some more. Nearly everything was done on a 10% margin basis. You only had to put down 10% of the cost of the stocks in order to buy them. And nearly everything was happening on speculation. Bill was really one of the first real investment counselors on Wall Street. He began to say that these people had had the money. Look, the day is going to come and we're going to have to start making our decisions on whether to purchase stocks or not based on fact rather than speculation. He said, sooner or later, this bubble's going to burst. And he said, now, I don't have the money to do this, but if you guys would back me financially, I'll go out and I'll actually visit these different companies. I'll visit their plants, their offices, whatever it might be. I'll talk to the employees. I'll look over the books wherever I can. I'll write up reports on these, and I'll send them back to Wall Street and then we could make these decisions based on fact rather than speculation. And they said, no, nah, Bill, we don't need that kind of information. We're making about all the money we want to make anyhow. Now, you know how we alcoholics are if we get a good idea. We're going to carry it through come hell or high water. <clears throat> he said, we gave up our positions and off we roared on a motorcycle. You know, he said, to hell with them. I don't need them anyhow. Mm -hmm. The sidecar stuff with tent blankets, a change of clothes, three huge volumes of financial reference service. Our friends thought a lunacy commission should be appointed. Perhaps they were right. 
I had had some success at speculation, so we had a little money. But we once worked on a farm for a month to avoid drawing on our small capital. That was the last honest manual labor on my part for many a day. We covered the whole eastern United States in a year. <clears throat> they spent a year coming up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States, visited approximately 100 of the largest companies. At the end of it, my reports to Wall Street procured me a position there and a use of a large expense account. The exercise of an option brought in more money, leaving us with a profit of several thousand dollars for that year. Bill started sending these reports back. These guys saw them, and they said, Oh, yeah, man, this is great information. Almost immediately, they put him on the payroll. They gave him an option, options to buy. They gave him a good expense account. And Bill was really, really living high on the hog. For the next few years, fortune threw money and applause my way. I had arrived. How many of us have done the same thing? This will literally work our tails off, and we get there, and my God, what a great feeling it that is. My judgment and ideas were followed by many to the tune of paper millions. The great boom of the late 20s was seething and swelling. Drink was taking an important, exhilarating part in my life. Now, Bill doesn't know he's alcoholic. He's just having lots of fun with his drinking. There was loud talk in the jazz places uptown. Everyone spent in thousands and chattered in millions. Scoffers could scoff and be damned. I made a host of fair-weather friends. Now, we know as an alcoholic, though, his alcoholism is going to progress. It's going to gradually get worse and worse and worse. Let's see where he goes from here. And I love Bill's story in this part because I surely can identify with this. I made a lot of money. I mean, not a lot of money in South Florida, but a lot of money out there in Oklahoma. I made a lot of money for a lot of people at one time. I'm also quite capable of losing a lot of money for a lot of people, which I did that too, so it all evened out. But, <laughs> but I like being in those jazz places uptown, drinking that money, you know, drinking them good whiskey and spending in, just like Bill said, he was, everyone spent in thousands and thousands and chattered in millions. Nobody had a dime, but then we like to talk about it. And man, everybody was talking about the deals they were making. I love to drink that good whiskey and, and be with those people. Now then he says, my drinking assumed more serious proportions, continuing all day and almost every night. The remonstrance of my friend terminated in a row, and I became a lone wolf. People began to say to Bill, you're drinking too much. Bill, why don't you cut back? Bill, why don't you quit? Bill, you're costing us money. He did the same thing so many of us did. He said, to hell with them. I don't need them anyhow. I'll operate on my own. There were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous apartment. There had been no real infidelity for loyalty to my wife. Helped at times by extreme drunkenness kept me out of those scrapes. I believe just about everything Bill ever wrote, but I wasn't quite sure about that statement. <laughs> Bill wrote a little book called As Bill Sees It. Lois wrote one called Lois Remembers. <laughs> Quite a bit of difference between the two in that area. Her memories wasn't quite how Bill saw it all the time. Yeah. Let's now, go over to page four. Now, well, Bill's got lots of willpower, lots of hope, hardworking, optimistic, self-made man, making a lot of money for a lot of people, living good, drinking good whiskey. And what happened? Abruptly, Abruptly in October 1929, hell broke loose on the New York Stock Exchange. After one of those days of inferno, I wobbled from a hotel bar to a brokerage office. It was 8 o'clock, five hours after the market closed. The ticker still clattered. I was staring at an inch of the tape which bore the inscription XYZ32. It had been 52 that morning. I was finished and so were many friends. The papers reporting men jet jumping to death from the towers of high finance. Well, that disgusted me. I would not jump. I went back to the bar. My friends had dropped several million since 10 o'clock. So what? Tomorrow was another day. And as I drank, the old fierce determination to win came back. How many of us have done the same thing? We come out of the hospital, the jailhouse, the divorce court, low, sad, depressed, stop off in the bar and have a couple of drinks. And as the alcohol courses through our veins, we say, by God, we'll show them. They're not going to treat me that way. And we're off and we're running again. That old fierce determination to win, to be somebody, to show them that we're just as good as they are. He said, next morning I telephoned a friend in Montreal. He had plenty of money left, and I thought I'd better go to Canada. 
You know, Bill was a drunk. He wasn't stupid. He went where the money was. It's up in Canada. By the following spring, we were living our accustomed style. I felt like Napoleon returning from Elba. No St. Helena for me. But drinking caught up with me again, and my generous friend had to let me go. This time, we stayed broke. Here's Bill. This has got to be a pretty good come down for a guy like Bill, who was so successful and wanted to be successful so bad. Then he said, we went to live with my wife's parents. That's really got to hurt a guy like Bill. Can't even make a living for his wife. He's got to go live with his wife's parents. I found a job, then lost as a result of a brawl with a taxi driver. Mostly no one would guess that I was to have no real employment for five years or hardly draw a sober breath. My wife began to work in a department store, coming home exhausted to find me drunk. I've become an unwelcome hanger-on at the brokerage places, those places where he made a lot of people a lot of money, where he used to be welcomed. Now he's showing up, and they're saying to him, Bill, you smell bad, you look bad. Why don't you just go on down the street to one of those other places and hang around? You're embarrassing us. That's got to be quite a come down for a guy like Bill. So he was drinking for good whiskey, good times, and then we saw him drink in more serious proportion. Now we're seeing him start to drink for another reason. We see the progression of the illness. Liquor ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. We're not drinking now for fun and good times. We're drinking now because we have to drink in order to live. Bathtub gin, two bottles a day, and often three got to be routine. Sometimes a small deal would nut a few hundred dollars, and I would pay my bills at the bars and delicatessens. This went on endlessly, and I began to waken very early in the morning, shaking violently. A tumbler full of gin followed by half a dozen of bottles of beer would be required if I were to eat any breakfast. Nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation, and there were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hope. Remember, Dr. Silkworth said we really could not differentiate the true from the false. We see Bill's life going to hell in a handbasket already. He can't see that. He thinks he can still control the situation. Trying to control the situation now, gradually things got worse. Things are bad for Bill, but now they're getting worse. The house was taken over by the mortgage holder. <coughs> My mother-in-law died. My wife and father-in-law became ill. Then I got a promising business opportunity. Stocks were at the low point of 1932 and I had somehow formed a group to buy. I was to share generously in the profits. Then I went on a prodigious bender, and that chance vanished. This is a story within itself. The people that really knew Bill knew how good he was at putting these little deals together. And they went to Bill, and they said, Bill, we've got a good opportunity for you to make some money and make us some money. We'd like for you to handle it. The only thing is you cannot drink. And Bill said, oh, hell, don't worry about that drinking. I'm through with that drinking. I've already quit anyhow. And he began to work on this deal, and he worked for a matter of months on it. And just before it was to be successfully completed, they're sitting around in a hotel room one night, and somebody passes around a bottle of Applejack, homemade stuff. This was during Prohibition years. Came to Bill, and he said, no, no, thank you. I'm not drinking. And it went right on by him. After a while, he came back around again, and a guy next to him said, Bill, you don't understand what's in this bottle. He said, this Applejack is called Jersey Lightning, finest Applejack in the world. You better have a drink. And Bill's mind said, hmm, I've never tasted any Jersey Lightning. No more thought than that. He reached out, grabbed the bottle, took a drink, triggered the allergy, couldn't stop drinking, and blew the whole deal. Now, the importance in that lies within the next statement. I woke up. This had to be stopped. For the first time, Bill could differentiate the truth from the false. He saw I could not take so much as one drink. I was through forever. Before then, I'd written lots of sweet promises, but my wife happily observed that this time I meant business, and so I did. He trotted out his willpower, and he said, Sick em, Will. We're through with that drinking forever. See, Bill doesn't know what we have learned today. That any time there's a battle going on between the willpower and the obsession of the mind, the obsession of the mind will win out each and every time over the willpower. It's stronger than our will. It's stronger than any promise that we might make. It, the obsession of the mind is an idea that overpowers all other ideas. And Bill didn't know that yet. 
So he's just trying to stay sober on willpower. People, people try to tell us we don't have any willpower. <clears throat> don't you believe that? We've got a tremendous amount of willpower. Every alcoholic I've ever known has got a tremendous amount of willpower. Weak-willed people do not become alcoholic. Third time they puke, they quit drinking. <laughs> alcoholic knows, by God, there's got to be some way to drink this damn stuff without puking, and we kill ourselves. <laughs> we got lots and lots of willpower. Yeah, I told my wife I got lots of willpower. She says, I know you do. You'll never have used much of it. <laughs> Now, let's see where he went on willpower. He said, shortly after I came home drunk, there had been no fight. What had been my high resolve? In other words, what was my willpower? I simply didn't know. It hadn't even come to mind. Someone had pushed a drink my way, and I'd take it. Was I crazy? See, if your willpower don't work, then you begin to question your sanity. Am I just crazy? Is that it? I began to wonder for such an appalling lack of perspective seemed near being just that. Anybody in here identify with Bill Wilson? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you betcha. Now, renewing my resolve, I tried again. Some time passed and confidence began to be replaced by cocksuredness. I could laugh at the gin mills. Now I had what it takes. One day I walked into a cafe to telephone. In no time I was beating on the bar asking myself how it happened. As the whiskey rose to my head, I told myself I would manage better next time. But I might as well get good and drunk then. And I did. Anybody identify with Bill? Now the remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. The courage to do the battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollably, and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. I hardly dared cross the street lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck, for it was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were still at last. The morning paper told me the market had gone to hell again. Well, so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. That was a hard thought. Should I kill myself? No, no, not now. Then came a mental, then a mental fog settled down, and Jim would fix that. So two bottles and oblivion. Now we're drinking for the sickest reason of all. We're drinking to get out of it. Willpower wouldn't work. We begin to question our sanity. We begin to think about suicide. And rather than kill ourselves, we now start to drink for oblivion, just to get the hell out of the picture. Only one thing wrong with oblivion, though, isn't there? You wake up. And that's what Bill was doing, getting drunk, passing out, waking up, getting drunk, passing out, waking up. So the mind and body are marvelous mechanisms, for mine endured this agony for two more years. Sometimes I stole from my wife's slender purse, and the morning terror and madness were on me. Again, I swayed dizzily before the open window or the medicine cabinet where there was poison, cursing myself for a weakling. There had been flights from city to country and back, as my wife and I sought escape. Then came the night when the physical and torture, mental torture were so hellish, I feared I would burst through my window, sash and all. Somehow I managed to drag my mattress to the lower floor, lest I suddenly leap. A doctor came with heavy sedative. Next day found me drinking both gin and sedative, and this combination soon landed me on the rocks. People feared for my sanity. Well, so did I. I could eat little or nothing when I was drinking, and I was 40 pounds underweight. Now we see a guy who's actually beginning to die from malnutrition. Remember, the calories we get from alcohol are empty calories. None of the amino acids, none of the vitamins, none of the things necessary for life. And we're drinking like Bill drinks and eating very little food, and slowly, slowly, slowly he's beginning to die. My, mother, my brother-in-law is a physician. And this is a fellow named Dr. Leonard Strong, married to Bill's sister. And through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics, the Towns Hospital in New York City. Under the so-called Belladonna treatment, my brain cleared. Hydrotherapy and mild exercise helped much. The Belladonna treatment was a drug treatment used to fool the body into thinking it had alcohol in it. We use Valium for that today. Then they use what they call Belladonna. 
Hydrotherapy is, is water treatment. And we saw some of that in an in a old style uh, treatment center over in Australia. And they strapped the alcoholic to a gurney and moved him into a shower room. Oval shaped shower room with shower heads all the way around the room. Alternating hot and cold water. And they're in there for about 30 minutes. Now it doesn't cure alcoholism. But it sure as hell makes a clean drunk out of you. I'll guarantee you that. (laughs) He said, best of all, I bet a kind doctor who explained that though certainly selfish and foolish, I had been seriously ill bodily and mentally. And this is when Dr. Silkworth explained to Bill his ideas about the physical allergy and the obsession of the mind. And Bill said, it relieved me somewhat to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor, but often remains strong in other respects. He knew he had a lot of willpower. And this explained to him why willpower wouldn't work. My incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained. Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. I went to town regularly and even made a little money. Surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. For the first time in his life, Bill understood the problem. He understood the allergy. He understood the obsession of the mind. He understood why willpower wouldn't work. And he felt, now that I know what's wrong with me, I'll not have to drink anymore. Self-knowledge will fix it. Let's see where he went on self-knowledge. But it was not. For the frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. And after a time, I returned to the hospital. Now, the first time was the summer of 1933. Now then, it's the summer of 1934. He's been drinking again now for almost a year. This was the finish, the curtain, it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delirium tremens. Oh, I would develop a wet brain, perhaps within a year. She would ha- would soon have to give me over to the undertaker or, or the asylum. Bill was laying in the hospital room there, sobering up, detoxing. She heard Lois speak to Dr. Silkworth and asked him, said, Dr. Silkworth, is he going to be able to make it this time? And he said, no, Lois, I don't believe he's going to be able to come back. He's gone over the edge. I don't think he's going to make it back. And then look what he said next. They did not need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. That's why you can't scare an alcoholic into staying sober. He knew and almost welcomed the idea. See, he wasn't afraid of dying. He was afraid of living and continuing on. It was a devastating blow to my pride. I, who thought so well of myself and my ability to, my capacity to surmount obstacles was cornered at last. Now I was plunged into the dark, joining that endless procession of solitude gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness after all. What I, what, what I would not give to make amends, but that was over now. See, Bill is totally hopeless, totally helpless, totally powerless over alcohol, mainly without hope. And we all know that you can't live too long without hope. Bill was without hope and hopeless. Now let's look at this next statement very carefully. No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. I've never seen a better description of step one. No step one written in those days. But this is where Bill took it. And he acknowledged he was absolutely powerless over alcohol. It had become his master. Now, if that that should happen to you and I today, we probably would say, well, that being the case, I guess I better go to AA. Bill didn't have any AA to go to. He was in the best treatment facility he knew of. And even though he's admitted complete powerlessness, taking what we know today is step one, the only thing he can do is leave that hospital Try to stay sober. Trembling, I stepped from the hospital a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Then came the insidious insanity of that first drink. 
In Armistice Day 1934, I was off again. Armistice Day 1934, his mind told him it'd be okay to drink. And Bill took a drink and triggered the allergy, and he couldn't stop. Everyone became resigned to the certainty that I would have to be shut up somewhere. I would stumble along to a miserable end. How dark it is before the dawn. In reality, that was the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted in what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. I wish no happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. Near the end of that bleak November, and I imagine it was a pretty bleak November, he started drinking on the 11th. He's been drunk ever since. I sat drinking in my kitchen. With a certain satisfaction, I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. My wife was at work. I wondered whether I dared hide a full bottle of gin near the head of her bed. I would need it before daylight. My music was interrupted by the telephone. The cheery voice of an old school friend asked if he might come over. This is Abby Thatcher, Bill's old drinking buddy. He was sober. You'll notice that's in a squiggly writing. I tell it. Very important. He was sober. <laughs> He said it was years since I remember his coming to New York in that condition. I was amazed. <coughs> Rumor had it that he had been committed for alcoholic insanity. I wondered how he had escaped. You know, that's what they used to do with people like us. They used to haul us in front of the judge. And the judge would commit us to the state insane asylum for alcoholic insanity. And you were to stay there until you got well. Think of no, that. No, no particular length till you got well. And about anybody could do that for you. Your spouse could. Your adult children could. Members of the law enforcement agencies could. And any interested friend could do it for you too. And the last bill I heard about Abby is he was to be committed to the nut house in the state of Vermont. Ebby's family was very prominent in Albany. In fact, Ebby's dad was a, the mayor of Albany at that time, running for re-election. And a lot of Ebby's uh, drinking and getting in trouble and him getting him out was embarrassing the family. So he called Ebby in one day and said, Ebby, said, you need to go over to our summer place over in Vermont. Sober up while you're over there. But basically you've got to get out of town. You're embarrassing my re-election campaign. And by the way, while you're there, try to fix up the summer place because I'll be over and we'll be over this summer, spend some time there. So he went over there to sober up and to fix up the summer place. And of course, you know, Ebby's an alcoholic. He can't sober up, but he's working around there fixing up the summer place. One day he was standing back looking and admiring a little paint job that he'd done on the side of the house. Drinking a little bit Drinking along with Drinking a little bit, yeah. Quite a bit. And the uh, pigeons were doing some things underneath those eaves down the side of that house he didn't like. Pooping on the house. Yeah. I, I don't talk that way. <laughs> so Abby went in the house and got him a shotgun and went to sh sh shooting at those pigeons, blowing holes in the side of the house. <laughs> well, the neighbors don't like this. So they called him have him arrested. They take him to jail. They took him before the judge, and they were going to sentence him to the state insane asylum. But Abby got real lucky. There was two fellows there, members of the Oxford group. One of them was Roland Hazard, and the other one was Zebra Graves. The judge's name happened to be Graves. Zebra was his son, and he knew that Zebra was staying sober by going to those Oxford group. They interceded on the, his behalf, on Abby's behalf. So if you'll release him to us, we'll take him to those Oxford groups, and maybe he too can stay, stay sober. Well, the judge didn't want to put him in jail any more than they do today. So re they released Abby to their care, and he began to go to the Oxford groups. He began to practice the tenets of the Oxford group, and sure enough, he stayed sober. A couple of months later, he moves to New York, to Calvary Mission, the headquarters of the Oxford groups in, in New York. And while he was there, he remembered his friend Bill. He said, I think I'll go over and help Bill as they help me. Because he liked that idea of trying to help other people. And Bill said, well, of course he, of course he would have dinner. Then I would drink with him openly. Unmindful of his welfare, I thought only recapturing the spirit of those other days. There was that time we had chartered an airplane to complete a jag. His coming was an oasis in this dreary desert of fertility. 
the very thing an oasis. Drinkers are like that. The door opened and he stood there, fresh skinned and glowing. There was something about his eyes. He was inexplicably different. What had happened? I pushed a drink across the table and he refused it. Disappointed but curious, I wondered what had got into the fellow he wasn't himself. Come, what's all this about, I queried. And he looked straight at me, simply but smilingly, he said, I've got religion. Now, I'm damn glad that didn't happen in my kitchen. <laughs> God, I have no idea what I would have done. But here's what Bill did. He said, I was aghast. <clears throat> so that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. Now I suspected a little cracked about religion. He had that starry-eyed look. Yes, the old boy was on fire, all right. But bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. But he had no running. In a matter of fact way, he told how two men had appeared in court persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. They had told of a simple religious idea. Which is step two. And a practical program of action. Steps three through twelve. That was two months ago, and the result was self-evident. It worked. Now, Bill knew all three things. He knew the problem from Silky. He knew this simple religious idea, referred to here as a religious idea, the need for the spiritual experience. And he knew the practical program of action necessary to find the spiritual experience. Immediately they began to go to Oxford group meetings. But remember, Bill had started drinking back on Armistice Day. The allergies got him and he can't stop. He's going to continue to drink for a while. But he's, he said uh, he had come to pass the experience along to me. If I cared to have it, I was shocked but interested. Certainly I was interested. I had to be for I was hopeless. He talked for hours. Childhood memories rose before me. I could almost hear the sound of the preacher's voice as I sat on still Sundays way over there on the hillside. There was that proffered temperance pledge I never signed. My grandfather's good nature contempt of some church, church folk and their doings. His insistence that the spheres really had their music, but his denial of the preacher's right to tell him how he must listen. His fearlessness, he spoke of these things just before he died. These recollections welled up from the past and they made me swallow hard. That wartime day in old Winchester Cathedral came back again. I had always believed in a power greater than myself. I had often pondered those things. I was not an atheist. Few people really are, for that means blind faith and a strange proposition that this universe originated in a cipher and aimlessly rushes nowhere. My intellectual heroes, the chemists, the astronomers, <coughs> even the evolutionists, suggested vast laws and forces at work. Despite contrary indications, I had a little doubt that a mighty purpose and rhythm underlay all. How could there be so much of precise and immutable law and no intelligence? I simply had to believe in a spirit of the universe who neither time nor limitation, but that was as far as I had gone. With ministers and the world's religions, I parted right there. When they talked of a God purse to me who was love, superhuman strength, and direction, I became irritated and my mind snapped shut against such a theory. To Christ I considered the certainty of a great man, not too closely followed by those who claimed him. His moral teaching most excellent. For myself, I had adopted those parts which seemed convenient and not too difficult. The rest I disregarded. Does anybody in here besides me identify with Bill Wilson? <laughs> we can see where Bill took step one. He admitted he was powerless and hopeless. On pages 10 and 11, Bill's beginning to question this solution. He's somewhere between step one, which he took, and now he's questioning maybe a part about step two, just like most of us did. His yeah. mind, he said, snapped shut against such theories. I remember that Abby's coming out of the Oxford groups, a group of people practicing first century Christianity to the best of their ability. And nearly all the terms that they use were highly religious in nature. And Bill doesn't like this at all. Well, he's, building, he's willing to believe in the great spirit or 
something like that. But he don't want he don't want to hear anything about the God of religion. Period. And he and Abby are sitting there talking this deal over, and Abby's on fire with this thing, trying to give to Bill what he had received. Bill's trying to resist him. The middle of page eleven. But my friend sat before me, and he made the point blank declaration that God had done for him what he could not do for himself. His human will had failed. Doctors had pronounced him incurable. Society was about to lock him up. Like myself, he had admitted complete defeat. Then he had, in effect, been raised from the dead, suddenly taken from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best he had ever known. Had this power originated in him? Obvious it had not. There had been no power in him than there was in me at that minute, and this was none at all. This is where the identification process is so important. Bill knew about Ebby. He knew how Ebby drank. And he knew that if Ebby had been sober for two months, some power greater than Ebby had to be working in Ebby's life. Whether Bill likes it or not is beside the point. Ebby is sitting there as living proof of the power working in a human life. That's what you and I have to offer today to the newcomer. You know, we're sitting there as living proof. There it is power greater than human power that's worked in our lives also. Whether the newcomer likes it or not is beside the point. We are the living proof of it. Ebby was the living proof to Bill. And even though he could see that, and even though he was interested in this thing, he still didn't like the idea of this power greater than human power as Ebby had expressed it to him in religious terms. Let's go over to page 12, he first said, paragraph. He said, Despite the living example of my friend, there remained in me the vestiges of my old prejudice. Bill still doesn't like this, even though Ebby is proof of it. Prejudice, by the way, means old ideas. The word God still aroused a certain antipathy. When the thought was expressed that there might be a God personal to me, this feeling was intensified. I didn't like the idea. I could go for such conception of creative intelligence, universal mind or spirit of nature, but I resisted the thought of the czar of the heavens, however loving his way might be. I have since talked with scores of men who felt the same way. Ebby was coming from the Oxford group. They were interested in first century Christianity and very strong about it. Ebby and Bill didn't understand that. He said, there's got to be a harder way to do this. <laughs> <laughs> that what you tell me is too simple. There's got to be a harder way to do it. Now let's look at this next statement very carefully. Yeah, I can see I'd like to have been there that day and, and watching Bill and Ebby. Ebby's on fire with this religious idea coming out of the Oxford group. Bill's sitting there about two thirds drunk, been drunk for about three weeks, and they're arguing about God as to who he is and who he isn't, et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. You know how we alcoholics are when we talk about that <laughs> out there when we're drinking. And I guess Ebby finally got tired of it. Finally he said, My friend suggested what then seemed a novel idea. And notice this is in squiggly writing. <laughs> Why don't you choose your own conception of God? And the instant he said that, his message changed from a religious message to a spiritual message. Religion says this is the way you have to believe. Spirituality says it really doesn't make any difference how you believe. The only question is, are you willing to believe? And this has opened the door for countless thousands and thousands and thousands of we alcoholics. Why don't you choose your own conception of God? I don't believe that Abby did that. I have any knowledge on his part. I think he did that out of total frustration and anger. He probably said, all hell, Bill, believe whatever you want to believe. <laughs> yeah. Another, another, one of those little, another one of those little coincidences. Yeah. Now, here's the effect it had on Bill. Well, that statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountain whose shadow I'd lived and shivered many years. I stood in the sunlight at last. It was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. I saw that growth could start from that point. Upon a foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend. Would I have it? Of course I would. 
I think I think the reason this had such a great effect on Bill and why why it is works so well for we alcoholics. When he said, Why don't you choose your own conception of God? We alcoholics have never had any problem with our own conception of anything. <laughs> yeah, let us believe in God the way we want to believe in God. Now we're talking about an entirely different ball game. See, I never had any problem with God. I had a hell of a problem with somebody else's conception of God. But when I find out I can have my own conception of God and believe in God any way that I want to, now then it's an entirely new ball game. Mm-hmm. That opens up the mind. Now we become willing. Now we become willingness. And he said, upon the foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend. Now this is Bill's first reference to a wonderfully effective spiritual structure that we're going to build. And he's going to paint a mind, he's going to paint a picture in our minds as we go through building this spiritual structure. And the first part of this structure is willingness. Willing to change, willing to believe something different, willing to admit that we're whipped. And that comes from step 1. Willingness is the foundation of the structure. A little later on we're going to see where where believing is the cornerstone of the structure. A little later on he's going to tell us what that structure is going to be and through which we're going to pass through it to freedom. So we're already beginning now to build that structure as we go through when we become willing. Now how does an alcoholic become willing to do these things that are so alien to our nature, to believe these things that are alien to our nature? How does an alcoholic become willing? Drinking whiskey. Drinking whiskey. A lot of it. Drinking whiskey. <laughs> you know, that's the only job that we can't help a newcomer with. Willingness has to come from within. And they have to drink enough whiskey, vodka or whatever, in order to become willing to change. You know, every once in a while I hear somebody say to me, I've been in AA and I've been working on step one for five years in AA. I say, no, you don't. You're not working on step one in AA. You work on step one out there. And if you're not willing, then go back out there and work some more. I say, hell, man, you're suffering from an alcohol deficiency. <laughs> go, out, <laughs> go out there and drink some more of that crap. And when you come back, you'll probably be willing. That's an inside job. We can help them with everything else, but we can't really help them with step one other than tell them what the problem is. I have a brother-in-law, and, and uh, Charlie knows him. He's been in and out of AA many times, been into at least 10 treatment facilities that I'm aware of. And if he was standing here tonight, I could ask him, I said, are you powerless over alcohol? He would stand up and we'll say, yeah, I'm powerless over alcohol. You know, been in and out of 10 treatment centers. Sure, I'm powerless over alcohol. But I finally figured out what his problem was. He had never been defeated. He's not willing. He's not willing. He's never been defeated. But he is powerless over alcohol. He's not been a lot of difference between being powerless over alcohol and being defeated. So he has never been defeated. Okay, Bill came to believe. Now this is surely this surely this is where Bill took step two. You know, this is where he came to believe that a power greater than himself could restore him to sanity, based on the simple little idea of why don't you choose your own conception of God? So he's really taken what we know today as step one and step two. No one and two written in those days, but we see Bill taking them. They go to Oxford for group meetings. Bill can't get sober. Finally, he has to be placed back in the town hospital for a withdrawal. And on page 13. We saw him take one and two. Now let's look on page 13 and see if we can't see him take what we know today as the last ten steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill was pretty sick, so they put him back in the hospital. <clears throat> At the hospital, I was separated from alcohol for the last time. Treatment seemed wise, for I showed signs of delirium tremens. There, I humbly offered myself to God as I then understood Him, to do with me as He would. I placed myself unreservedly under His care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing. Without, without Him, I was lost. The Oxford Group first tenet that they were using was called surrender. And we see Bill making his surrender. Later on, when he wrote our 12 steps, he knew no alcoholic would ever want to surrender. 
but he might make a decision. So he took that surrender thing and made it into step three, where we made a decision to turn our will, our lives over to the care of God as we understand Him. There we see Him taking what we know today as step three. He said, I ruthlessly face my sins. Their next tenant was examine your sins. And Bill knew no self-respecting alcoholic is going to want to do that. So he changed that to made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. There he's taking step four. And became willing to have my newfound friend take them away, root and branch. I've not had a drink since. You'll notice the word friend is capitalized. He's referring to God. And that little statement, I became willing to have my newfound friend take them away, root and branch. I've not had a drink since. He's referring there to what we know today as step six and seven. We became willing to have God remove these things and ask Him to do so. My schoolmate visited me, and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. They had a tenant called confessing and sharing. And Bill knew no alcoholic would ever confess and share to nothing. So he changed that to admit it to God, to ourselves and another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. There he's taken step five with Abby. We made a list of people I'd heard and toward whom I felt resentment. Step eight. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals in admitting my wrong. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. Step nine. So we see him there using steps eight and nine. I was to test my thinking by the new God conscious within. Com- common sense would thus become uncommon sense. Later on, he made that into step ten, where we continued to take personal inventory. I would sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Never was I to pray for myself, except as my request bore on my useless to others. Then only might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. And he made that into step 11, where we sought through prayer and meditation. My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my Creator that I would have the elements of a way of a living which answered all my problems. It's got to be the first part of step 12, having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps. Belief in the power of God, plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were essential requirements. Simple, but not easy. Poor alcoholics got to give up the most important things in our lives. And the first thing is our alcohol. The second thing is our self-centeredness, the things that we love the most. A price had to be paid. It meant the destruction of self-centeredness. And I must turn in all things to the Father of Light who presides over us all. Now, Bill was there in the towns. He had been withdrawn. Abby came to see him. They began to apply the Oxford group tenets in Bill's life. Now, let's see what effect that it had on Bill. He said these were revolutionary and drastic proposals. But the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory followed by such a peace and serenity as I'd never known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up as though the great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to most men gradually, but His impact on me was sudden and profound. Bill thought he was going crazy. He said, for a moment I was alarmed and called my friend the doctor to ask if I were still sane. And he listened in wonder as I talked. Finally, he shook his head saying, something has happened to you that I don't understand, but you'd better hang on to it. Anything is better than the way you were. Now, Bill went in that town's hospital, restless, irritable, and discontented. Bill went in that hospital filled with shame, fear, guilt, and remorse. Bill went in that hospital as a very selfish, self-centered human being. Bill went in that hospital with the idea of making more and more money and showing them that he was just as good as they are. Now, after this spiritual experience, his whole personality had changed. Let's look and see what happens to him, how he felt and what he thought after that experience. He said, while I lay in the hospital, I thought to him there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been so freely given me. Perhaps I could help some of them. They in turn might work with others. My friend, and this time it's a little F, we're talking about Abby. My friend had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all my affairs. Particularly was it imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. 
Faith without works was dead, he said, and how appallingly true for the alcoholic. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again. And if he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be dead and dead, and with us, indeed, and with us, it's just like that. And Bill left that town's hospital with a complete new set of ideas, and he immediately, immediately began trying to work with other alcoholics. Didn't help any of them for six months. Finally got to Dr. Bob, and got, Dr. Bob got sober. And you know, from that time on, Bill very, very seldom went back into any kind of business thing at all. From that time on until the time he died in 1971, he devoted the majority of his life in setting up the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, in working with other alcoholics, trying to help other people have what had been so freely given to him. And lo and behold, he stayed sober from 1934 until he died in 1971. It really, really does work. He said, my wife and I abandoned ourselves with enthusiasm to the idea of helping other alcoholics to a solution to their problems. The woman behind the man. Sometimes we forget about the women behind the men. Henrietta Cyberling, Ann Smith, you know, Lois. There's lots of women behind the men. Had not it been for those women, the men couldn't have made it. Non-alcoholic women, too. That's right. Lots of non-alcoholic women. al The women behind the men. Don't ever want to forget that. You see, he goes on to say it's a design for living that works in rough going. The work is really, really hard, but the pay is good. You know, get to stay sober, get to live a good life. And I've been on this path for 32 years, thank God. My wife has been with me. And many, many times I didn't want to do the things I needed to do. But she encouraged me, the woman behind the man. And uh, I love her for that. And I'm, I'm grateful she stayed sober tonight. Okay, now we've been able to see the problem through the doctor's opinion. We've been able to see another alcoholic who had that problem through Bill's story. We've been able to identify with Bill in Bill's story. We've been able to see him affect a recovery from that condition. And if we're new, then surely, surely, we can begin to experience a little bit of hope here. Um, enough like this guy, if he could recover, then surely, surely, maybe I can too. I'm beginning to experience a little bit of belief here. Believing if he can do so, maybe I can do so. Believing that if God worked in his life, then maybe he can work in my life too. So we surely by now see and understand what the problem really is. So now then, it's going to tell us what the solution to this problem is. And it's not by accident, the very next chapter in the big book is entitled, There is a Solution. There is a solution to this situation that we've seen in the doctor's opinion and Bill's story. There is a solution to the situation we're living in. And, and if the problem is powerless then the answer has got to lie within power. And in this chapter 2, we're going to talk about two powers. We're going to talk about the power of the fellowship that supports us. We're going to talk about the power of the vital spiritual experience which changes us. And if we who are powerless over alcohol, if we can get these two powers in our lives then maybe, maybe, we'll be able to recover like Bill Wilson did. And the first half of this chapter is going to be devoted to the power within the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. But then it's going to warn us that that alone is not sufficient. The last half of this chapter will be talking about the power through the vital spiritual experience which changes us. The first thing we'll look at is the power 
of the fellowship, Joe. And a friend of mine, a guy I sponsored for 22 years before he died, his name was Harold. He said, there's as many different solutions there are people in AA. I said, no, Harold, if you look at the chapter, I think it tells you how many solutions there are. There is a solution. Two powers, but only one solution. And our book said we, there's that big word again, we have Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who were just as hopeless as Bill. Nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. We are average Americans. Today we can say we're average citizens of the world. Because my last understanding, we were in 154 countries of the world. When we go to Toronto, we're going to see a flag ceremony. I suspect there will be more flags coming down rather than 150. At least I hope so. And we're so, not just thousands anymore. No. We number now over 2 million worldwide. I got a printout at home that shows me this has been 25 million big books have been sold from 1939 till this present time. 25 million books somewhere. I don't know where they are, but they're there. <laughs> but we got 2 million members. <laughs> so all sections of this country and men's occupations are represented as well as many political, economic, social, and religious backgrounds, we are people who normally would not mix. As I look around the room tonight, I would say we are people who normally would not mix. <laughs> We're the most mixed up group of people in South Florida here tonight. But, but, it says, there exists among us a fellowship of friendliness and an understanding which is indescribably wonderful. And you heard it before the meeting. The talking, the laughing, the joking, the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got sober on the spirit of AA. I got sober on the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had no program. There's enough power in this room right here tonight with us that a person who doesn't want to drink don't have to drink unless they want to. There's a lot of power in this room right here tonight because we can do what I cannot do, you see, until I, too, can come to believe. But that's a little bit further down the line. Now, he's going to use <clears throat> that example of something we already know about to drive home the point about the friendliness and fellowship and understanding that we have in AA. All good writers do this. When they want to teach you something new, they will try to use an example of something you already know and then use that to describe and teach and show you what they really want you to understand. He said, we are like the passengers of a great liner. The moment after rescue from shipwreck, when camaraderie, joyousness, and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. Now remember, he was writing this in 1937, 1938, 1939. The Titanic was still fresh on everybody's mind. And in those days, when you traveled from one continent to another, you traveled on the ocean liners. That was the way before we had the air travel that we have today. And on those ocean liners, you had a distinct class system. If you were real poor, if you were an immigrant from Europe coming to the United States, you didn't have much money, you could buy what they call the steerage section. And the steerage section was way down in the bowels of the ship. No fresh air, dormitory-style living. I call it the cheese sandwich section. Now, if you had a little money and you wanted better accommodations, you could go for fourth class and you came up a deck or two. Then you could go to third class. Then you could go to second class. And then you could have go to first class. So you had a very distinct class system. And people traveling across the, the ocean on these ocean liners, the people in steerage section never got to meet the people on the, in, the other, in the other sections. In fact, they even had stairways fixed where they couldn't accidentally run into each other. And it's a long way from the steerage section up until first class. He said, unlike the feeling of the ship's passengers, however, our joint escape from disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways. Now just think. The Titanic hits the iceberg. And all these people are trying to, to save themselves. 
and a few of them make it out of the steerage section. And they're standing up on the top deck. And they got on their old work clothes and old brogan shoes. And right next to him is not only a guy from the first class section, but he's been eating at the captain's table. Now that was the elite part of the ship. If you could eat at the captain's table, that means you had not only the right kind of money, old, old money. No new money. You had the right religion. You had the right ethnic background. You had the right everything. Now this guy from the captain's table is standing right here beside this man who for some way got up there from the steerage section. They have nothing at all in common with each other. But the ship is sinking. The lifeboats are all gone. So what do they do? Well, they jump overboard. And the instant their butts hit that cold water, they had something in common. How in the hell do we save ourselves? And they grabbed on to each other, held on to each other, grabbed on to anything that could float. And I doubt very seriously if the man from the captain's table requested a financial statement from the man from the steerage section. <laughs> and when they pulled these guys out of that water and they got back together, there was a feeling amongst them that was indescribably wonderful. And it's always been that way. If you have escaped in a group from a common peril, there is a feeling amongst you which is indescribably wonderful. You can't describe it. There's a friendliness, a fellowship, an understanding that is indescribably wonderful. Now, when they got back on land, though, and they looked at each other, and probably the man from the steerage section said, well, hell, I don't, I don't belong with this guy. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with him. And then the guy from the captain's table said, well, I sure don't belong with him. And they left and went their separate ways, never and ever to see each other again. And they lost that feeling they had for each other. But you see, our book says, this feeling of having shared, unlike the feeling of the ship's passengers, however, our joint escape and disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways because our peril is always out there. And it's right outside the door. And I can go anywhere in the world today and go into an AA meeting and I still have the same feeling as a friendliness an understanding wherever they are, whatever country they're in, whatever language they speak. Because our escape continues as we go along. Our common peril never subsides. It's always out there. And he says, the feeling of having sh shared in a common peril is one element in the powerful cement which binds us. One element in the powerful cement which binds us. But that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined. In other words, fellowship alone is not sufficient. The been tremendous fact for every one of us is that we've discovered a common solution. We have a way out on which we could absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. This is the great news this book has to carry to those who suffer from alcoholism. Not the news of the fellowship, but the news of the common solution. And later on we're going to see that the common solution is the vital spiritual experience during which we change. Fellowship will support us for a period of time. But if we don't find that common solution, eventually we turn right around and go right back to drinking again. And I think one of the greatest tragedies I see in the world today, and there's lots of tragedies in this world today, but one of the greatest ones I see is we people who are members of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are spending literally hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds and thousands of men and women work hours, trying to attract other alcoholics to our fellowship when we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous who are sitting around dying from untreated alcoholism. They're participating in fellowship, but they're not participating in a common solution. They're not having the vital spiritual experience. 
Why aren't they? Because nobody's telling them they need to. We're afraid we might hurt their feelings. We're afraid we might run them off. And we're saying, come on in here and we're going to love you till you learn to love yourself. You know, what we need to say to these new alcoholics is, look, man, I'm glad to see you here as a member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous will give you the strength to stay sober for a period of time. But let me warn you about something. That if you don't do something about changing, and change is brought about through our program of action and the spiritual experience, if you don't do something about changing, you're going to go right back to drinking again. Now let me take you by the hand and let me walk with you as you work your way through the program of action. And you'll have a spiritual awakening and then you're not going to have to drink anymore. That's our responsibility. And I think we're responsible to see that every newcomer understands this page. You bet your fellowship is great. My God, we can't live without it. But fellowship alone is simply not sufficient. Now, how do I know that? How do I know that? Well, I came to AA one time, and I really enjoyed your fellowship. But I didn't know nothing about your program, and I got drunk. And I came back to your fellowship, and I really enjoyed it. But I didn't do anything about your program, and I got drunk again. And I came back to your fellowship, and I really enjoyed it. But I didn't do anything about your program, and I got drunk for the third time. And I damn near died from alcoholism. And I come back to your fellowship, and I really enjoyed it. But this time I picked up the book. And this time I worked the program. And I haven't found it necessary to drink again since that time. I am living proof of this page 2017 in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a perfect example of trying to stay sober on fellowship only. It simply does not work. Now, now we'll do no more preaching. Guarantee, <laughs> Joe. Hope, I hope you don't believe that. <laughs> on page 20. Let's go over to page 20. We're going to see why fellowship alone is insufficient again. You may be already asked yourself why it is that so all of us became so very ill from drinking. Doubtless you are curious to discover how and why, in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. Now, if you're an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, well, what do I have to do? Well, it's the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. Remember earlier we talked about precisely, specifically, well, here's that word, specifically. We shall tell you what we've done. Before going into detailed discussion, it may be well to summarize some points as we see them. How many times people have said to us, I can take it or leave it alone. Why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman or quit? That fellow can't handle his liquor. Why don't you try a beer and wine and lay off the hard stuff? His willpower must be weak. He could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl, I should think he'd stop for her sake. The doctor told him that if he ever drank again, it would kill him. But there he is, all lit up again. Now, these are commonplace observational drinkers which we hear all the time. Back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. Now, we're going to look at two kinds of drinkers that these expressions that Joe just read would refer to. The first one is moderate drinkers. They have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they have good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. Remember, they have a couple of drinks, slightly tipsy, out of control, beginnings of a nauseous feeling. Alcohol is no big deal for them. They can quit drinking any time they want to. They can take a drink and drink no more. It's just no problem for them. They have little trouble in giving up alcohol entirely or learning how to control their drinking. Then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally, and it may even cause him to die a few years before his time. Now, if a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or the warnings of a doctor becomes operative, if they do, this man can stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult and troublesome, and he may even need a little medical attention. And we call this guy the heavy or the hard drinker. They drink like we drink. 
But if a good enough reason presents itself, they'll do one or two things. They may learn how to control their drinking. They do not have the physical allergy. Or they may quit drinking entirely. They do not have the obsession of the mind. They drink like we drink, but they're not alcoholic. And you and I see them all the time. They're the ones that said, when I was in the service, I was an alcoholic also. And I got out of the service, and I got married and went to church and quit drinking, and I don't see why the hell you can't. No, no, they're not alcoholics. They're heavy or hard drinkers. Now, here's the third kind of drinker. But what about the real alcoholic? Now, he may start off as a moderate drinker. Many of us did. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker. Many of us stayed periodic. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. Now, here's the fellow who's been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. Now, as we go down through this description of the real alcoholic, when you see one in there that matches you, would you hold your hand up, please? Yeah. I'd like to see if we're in a room full of real alcoholics. But that one, he said, but at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. That's the first description right there. Charlie uh, said earlier today that I crossed over that line into alcoholism. I'm not real sure what line he was talking about, but I was drunk when I went over it, and I know that. <laughs> Now, here's the fellow who's been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. He does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking as a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Anybody like that? Yeah. I yeah. get good looking and out of debt, just like that. <laughs> he is seldom mildly intoxicated. He's all more, always more or less insanely drunk. Anybody like that in here? Yeah. His disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature, but little. Anybody like that? He may be one of the finest fellows in the world, but yet him drink for a day, and he frequently becomes disgustingly and dangerously antisocial. Anybody like that when they drink? He has a positive genius for getting tight at exactly the wrong moment, particularly when some important decision must be made or engagement kept. He is often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor, but in that respect he is incredibly dishonest and selfish. He often possesses special abilities, skills, and aptitudes, has a promising career ahead of him. He uses gifts to build up a bright outlook for his family and himself, and then pulls the structure down on his head by a senseless series of sprees. Anybody like that in here? You betcha. He's a fellow who goes to bed so intoxicated he ought to sleep the clock around. Yet early next morning, he searches madly for the bottle he misplaced the night before. Any bottle searchers in here? Yeah. Phyllis, Phyllis, and I used to, Phyllis and I used to buy a lug of whiskey, which is three quarts or three pints or three fifths, and one to share and one to hide from each other. Well, we did. Now, if he can afford it, he may have liquor concealed all of his house to be certain no one gets his entire supply from him to throw down in the waste pipe. As matters grow worse... He begins to use a combination of high-powered sedative and liquor to quiet his nerves so he can go to work. Then comes the day when he simply cannot make it and gets drunk all over again. 